candy camera mm -hmm. moments. You're doing good. No, I didn't I mean for me. I'm Mr. Smooth, Debonair. Okay, we're live on Facebook, building an audience, letting everybody know that we're here. Okay. So, I'll go see if anybody else. Y'all get stained glass news? Say it again. Any of y'all ever get stained glass news? Yes. Yeah. I used to, no longer now that I live down here. How do you get that? From store, the one of the stores. Flyers, oh, well. uh, I don't know if George and the company well, have I used them. to get the Spectrum one. By yeah. Do you have any of the newer, uh, any of them that we're going to pass out? <laughs> no. <laughs> so just make us all drool. <laughs> we're just going to make you drool. And, okay. Yeah. Okay, so good morning, everybody. I understand morning. we're live. So for those of you in Asia, and Europe, and <laughs> wherever, um, welcome. Um, I want to appreciate uh, first by thanking uh, Glass Crafters for having me and our company, Stained Glass Ideas. Uh, we are a uh, manufacturer, innovative in the industry in the stained glass business. Uh, just a little bit of history is um, uh, my name is Bob James. I'm a graduate engineer from University of Florida, barely, 1982 for those that are counting. Um, I got in the art business a little over 11 years ago and started uh, an art gallery at the wrong time um, with the recession and everything. I own an art agency and I've uh, been fortunate enough to meet an individual by the name of Stanley Kaufmanstein. He's a um, 73 year old uh, master stained glass individual who has uh, been into business for over 53 years. I uh, actually became his agent back in 2009 and me being a typical engineer, I can't draw or paint to save my life. He says, well I'll teach you. And uh, so over four years ago he, I became an apprentice of his from washing the windows to vacuuming the floors. And he taught me how to cut, lead, draw, cartoon, design. And over four years ago, I painted my first Jesus face, which I still have today. <laughs> um, we, uh, Stained Glass Ideas works with uh, distribution in the marketplace. And um, Glass Crafters being here in uh, Sarasota is awesome because we're in Cocoa Beach, Florida. So if you ever get to Cocoa Beach, please give us a call, look us up, and we'll show you our little humble abode. Um, so Stanley Kloppenstein is somewhat, I, I think he'll be around till he's 100. He'll probably die with a paintbrush in his hand. He loves to draw cartoon and such. He has cut back Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, and now is actually got his master studio in his uh, home in Melbourne and continues to consult and paint and um, if you would the next generation a new regime is stepping into place and um, we'll never be a Klopfenstein but uh, we have learned to paint and do many things and we have uh, uh, several other master painters or uh, that will be master painters that work with us in, um, in the production facility and things. So today we're going to learn the basics of stained glass painting, first steps. Um, many of y'all are master uh, stained glass people, and this will just add another dimension to what you already may or may not do. The ultimate goal is going to be to show you how to paint a rose. Okay? A rose is um, uh, uh, one of our basic you believe it, what steps to painting. So in this process, we've got um, a few things that we need. And for those of y'all that need reference for down the road um, and have access to Stained Glass News, I've written a series of five articles um, that are still available that can be pulled up. And um, 
uh, on the art of painting. So the steps I'm going to go through here are written out in five series, five different articles over the course of uh, about a year and a quarter um, in Stained Glass News. That's an interesting <laughs> publication. Yeah. Um, well, one of the first things you need for painting is you need a light box. A light box is uh, going to allow you to um, actually see the pattern with the piece of glass. So we need a light box. We need a kiln. We're utilizing metal oxide paints just like they did 900, 1,000 years ago. One of the biggest differences, these metal oxide paints, um, which might be cobalt, copper, um, other minerals and materials they used to have to go find, mine, ground, to make it into a powder. Now you can purchase those paints from a Roche or a Fusemaster through Glass Crafters. Um, and those are now in a jar. You don't have to grind those anymore. So we need a light box. We're going to need paints, of course. You need a kiln because the kiln is going to take you up to 1250 degrees to fire your black tracing paints and your blacks. And those metal oxide paints become one with the glass, if you would. And actually, you wouldn't call it food fuse, but it is becomes glass. And as long as you don't uh, drop in and break your piece of glass, just like the cathedrals, 900-year-old art forms in Europe and other places, uh, should last many, many generations to come. So. Light box, kiln. Kilns are available for many distributors, different uh, manufacturers. Stanley Klopfenstein invented a kiln over 30 years ago specifically designed for glass painting. We get five, six, seven firings a day versus the brick style kilns that have been on the market forever or for a long time that you typically can only get one firing a day. So Stanley designed kilns specifically for painting, and that's painting on glass. So those are available too. We do build those and sell those through um, uh, uh, glass wrappers, if so chose to. So light box, kiln, paints, brushes, brushes. You really only need about six brushes to do stained glass paint. The, br the main brush is the signed script brush. And that script brush is going to be, allow you, it's an inch and a quarter brush. This is a tiny, tiny script brush. But the one we typically use is about one and an eighth inch. It's called a script or sign line liner paint brush. Then we use what's called a fanning brush. We have a fanning brush. And there's uh, different styles of fanning brushes. These are going to be used for your shading. Okay. Then we're going to use, we can take an oil type paint brush. And those fan brushes come in different sizes and width and shapes. But I'll tell you for about six different brushes that you'll need to get started. But you can add to your collection of brushes softer brushes, harder brushes. Okay. Then you need an oil type brush. And an oil brush is going to be a stiff brush and that's going to allow you to take paint off. Stained glass painting is not like oil or watercolor. It's actually the reverse. You place paint on, let it dry, and then take paint off. Okay. So it's a reverse type process. Um, which makes it even a little more interesting. So, about six different brushes. Uh, fan brush, number one script writing brush, an oil type brush, and then a, um, a brush which actually you can pick up from uh, any hardware store, like a three inch for matting and a stippling brush, a stiff type brush, which allows you to uh, brush off or mat your piece. So, then, with those type of brushes, we have our metal oxide. It was only showing the first 10 inches. The first 10 inches. Ah, very good. That's good to know. So, 
fan brushes back here. Script writing brushes here. I want to get a shot of that. Um, oh, uh, we have the script, the fans, an oil type brush, which can be cut back in a, um, a form. But again, you basically can start with six brushes. The matting brush can be a two inch or three inch or even one inch. Um, that you can pick up at Lowe's, Hardware, any um, inexpensive place. The, the fine brush, which you can uh, pay up to $250 for, is a badger brush. But there are what's called um, craft style brushes, which can run you about $35. And that will allow you to do your, your sweeps across your uh, glass um, for, for the painting. Okay. so. We're going to start with a pattern or some picture that you'll, you'll choose. This particular one happens to be a rose, yellow rose with green leaves and a multicolored background, which is actually should be blue, but because of the glass and the light refractuation, refractory, um, we got a little pinkish, but if you can picture that as blue. So it could be any picture. If you if you happen to look here, all these type of emblems are going to be the same style process. Um, we primarily use primary colors. So for paints, we use a black tracing paint. Then for colors, we use a blue, a yellow, a red, and we take our primary colors to achieve other colors. So um, they do sell many different colors of paints out in the marketplace, um, but we try to stick with primary colors. So we're going to start, and we're going to make an eight-inch rose, and we're going to kind of do it like a cooking class because of the process to actually paint the rose and fire it, you're looking at about uh, five hours from start to finish to do rows, which you could do many roses at a time. You might be able to do five roses in a six hour period. And so when we're making production, we do. But we're gonna start with make an eight inch rose. So you can do that on any type of glass. Uh, we've chosen glue chip glass, available obviously from glass crackers, um, but it could be window pane. It could be a CD. It could be any type of glass you're looking for, or type of effect you're looking for. So for this particular uh, demonstration, um, we're going to take our pattern, and please picture that as a beautiful yellow with green leaves and a blue sky. And says, yes. Bob, does it have to be fusing glass? It does not have to be fusing glass. As I mentioned, it, you can actually use a double strip window pane to paint on, and we do. For our portrait quality work or others, we do use a window pane. But that's if you're small faces and things that you don't want any distortions. But then regular sheet glass from Glass Crafters is also available. Most of the time for our artwork, we'll use an Artique, clear Artique, to give you a little bit of flare behind the paint. Or in this case, the glue chip, which will give you the, the flare, and you'll see that as a result. So what we do here is we actually take this pattern that you've chosen out of whatever patterns you draw or copy out of a magazine or anything and then place that under your um, under your sheet. Now if I had a glass, if I had a light box here which didn't make the car I put one on your stool if you want to oh. plug that in and use it So, we are at the right place for all the tools and supplies. Perfect. Great. Good thinking, sir. Okay. This helps marvelously. Okay. So, with the light box in place, you can actually see through the sheet of paper or the drawing or the uh, pattern that you're wanting to copy. 
So, what we're going to be doing is what's called lining. That's the first step. So with lining, we have our black paint. I need you to all have quite the imagination this morning. Since you're all artists, craft people, you do. Uh, these cups are, this is uh, black paint, blue paint, yellow paint. There we go. So, the first step is lining. So we take our uh, script brush, which might have an inch and an eighth length, but this one does not. So we get our black paint, and then we're going to start lining the black lines. The black lines. Simply, slowly, the black lines. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> this is a very a much faster process than normal. Trust me. So an hour passes. So an hour passes. We take up our sheet here. An hour passes. After it's kiln fired, we now have, voila. So Bob, how long is that kiln process? Our kiln process from start to finish, we actually fire in 29 minutes. That's taking our metal oxide, hand-painted piece, firing 29 minutes. The extra time is to cool down. So before you can actually touch it and pick it up, you're looking at about an hour total time period, start to finish on our kiln firing. Now, Two hours have passed. Yes. But there is a step here that we like to share that um, uh, to help in the process. This could actually be like this. Our first process with the black paint in the clear piece, which we jumped ahead slightly, we're back to our clear. We take our one inch, one dollar brush, mix in the black paint, put all the black paint all over the piece. So all of this is black now. Okay. And we can speed that up. It may take three or four minutes to dry completely. This is a water-based metal oxide paint. And it like this. And it helps speed up the drying process. Very fast. Okay. So now your piece. That's one process. So that's just a little trick for down the road here when we do the blues and the yellows. I wanted to make sure I covered that. Okay, so the two hours have passed. We have our piece lined. So now we're going to come in. This is fired and permanent. This will not scratch off. It's in, it's become one with the glass, okay? Yes, sir? Bob, can you explain that black process again? Why did you paint all over your nicely painted lines with black and then dry it with a hair dryer? Well, I actually had skipped ahead a little bit. Um, that's just a trick for when we get into putting the uh, like the final yellow on and or just another process to speed up because with the blacks we can actually go in if this was black and there was some other pattern in here we could actually go in with our brushes such as the oil based brush this is black or so, and we can actually come in here and take this paint off to make another piece. So this is all black, and as we're taking paint off, we're leaving black lines wherever we wanted those. Okay. So that's the usual way. To do it? No, what the usual way to take this is to take, and I'm apologize. <coughs> the expert painter called in sick this morning, so you get the substitute. <laughs> so we have our clear piece here with our pattern. Okay. We've taken this and we've taken a lining brush with our black paint and line the black lines. So that, this is the traditional method. Actually if you go back years and years ago, you may not even have this pattern. 
and they were just painting on the glass because they didn't have light, right? So if you go back eight, nine hundred years, a thousand years ago, they would just come in here, no light box, see something or have something in their mind, and now they're just painting. That's a good one. So we're painting. So in this case, we're, if you would, this is the advanced and modern way. <laughs> People still do it without patterns. I mean, master painter Stanley can come in and just start painting. Others can come in and just look at you and start painting. Uh, that's at some other level, right? So we've come in here and we painted our black lines. So the the, the one hour process on the kiln firing is gone. We end up with this piece here. This is the black line. Okay. Okay. So the next step. We have our beautiful outline is what's called um, the uh, shading and matting. So the, uh, the shading and matting. So what we're going to want, what we're going to end up with as we are adding paints, we've, we're going to darken this again. You say our pattern's still under here. This is permanent. So we're going to take our paints, mix, dry, or it can air dry. Okay. So now this is black again. This is all black. And then we've come in and we're going to remove paints. It's the reverse process of oil or watercolors. We're going to remove paints such that we're left with, with the outline for the shading. So we've come in here and we've taken off paints, take off paints, take off paints. We may come in here with the, uh, with the point and come in and take off, get in a little finer, clean off everything. Then we come in with a point. Okay. Any point will do. You can use a, a stick, craft stick, or uh, a lot of times we'll sharpen the end of a, of a brush because we're doing paint work and then I have a point on the end. We also use needles. We use a stick with a needle in it for fine line detail. So we would come in here, again, using your imagination. This is partially black. And then we'll come in and draw a vein of a leaf. It's all black in there. And we've drawn in what we call stick lighting. So we've drawn the vein. And then we'll come in and we'll actually take off paint around the inside of the leaf and follow the border such that it's called stick lighting. So we do that for each of the leaves. And then we'll come in and do the petals. We'll come in and take out the paints for the petals for our stick lighting. We'll continue with the leaves. Continue with the leaf, following a pattern or just free from. Come in with the veins. And we do this for the whole, all the leaves, and outline stick lighting around the petals. That's so it. We're removing the paint. You want to be careful. This is powdered paint, and if you were to put your finger in it, you left your finger. But what's nice about this, it's very forgiving. You can take your black paint again and start the whole process again. So you're not ruining anything. Of course, you'd rather do it at the beginning to put your finger in it than towards the end because then you're redoing all your stick lighting. So we continue with the process. Stick lighting, leaves, veins, around the rows and everything. Then we'll come in with a fan brush. And we've got like different types of fan brushes. Different fan brushes. 
but it really doesn't matter. It's a bunch you'll get more comfortable with. We'll come in with a fan brush and we're wanting to do shading. So shading is going to help with, this is all black right now, but we come in with the fan brush off a vein and we just gently take off a little black paint. And we do that kind of in a flow like your for the petals, you might just brush it, brush off a little, continue with the petals. Depending on which way the light goes, which way you're wanting the veins to go, you might go up, you might come down, you might go all around. So Bob, I'm understanding this is your air dried black paint that you've applied on top of your kiln fired lines. That's correct. And even though it's paint and it's been dried, it's going to come off the glass fairly easily with your brush. Very, very easily as you lightly brush, yes. It's a, um, it, you can't blow it off, but any light touching, um, the paint comes off very easily. It's just a water based paint that um, has air dried, or in this case, with blow dryer. Um, because it, it wasn't yes. just a powder a few minutes ago. Yes, it was. Before you mix it with water and put it up to the glass. That's correct. Now you've dried it off, it's kind of like a thin film of powder again. That's correct. Very good. Good analogy there. So we've done our stick lighting, and we are actually, the piece is going to be ready for firing, and you pick it up gently on the corners. Okay, so you take that piece, which will look something like that and that is where we've come in with our stick and then the lines oh that's very dramatic in the light table right, right. come on up take a look yeah we'll come in here draw on our stick lights around the leaves come in here then our little veins we may be using our stick with needle and then we come in with the fan brush and we'll gently like that. So one petals come up this way. This way. There's really no extreme right or wrong. <clears throat> and then we come in here with stems, the stems, touch them up. Like that. Okay. So one of the things that um, after you've cleaned this, you can maybe knock it off. We'll use sometimes a can of air or on the shop we have a compressor. Blow it off. And what you want to be careful of is fingerprints, anything else. You've got to remember you're on a, a light table painting and like you'll get paint on the back. So you need to clean the back off and you can just do that with your shirt <laughs> or apron or a uh, paper towel and um, to, to clean the surface because if you don't, one, it will may stick to the bottom of your kiln, um, not likely, uh, but uh, it will become one with the glass too and you might get some unwanted effect or it might turn out really nice. So that's the uh, step of stick lighting and shading. Okay, uh, so I'll see that. Back to the kiln. Now it goes into the kiln, and we fire that piece. Okay, so the next step is we're going to take our kiln-fired piece after it's cooled down, place it back here, and now we're going to apply color first color we're going to apply is blue. We're going to, in this case, we're going to want, we're going to use a blue sky, blue background, and yellow and blue make what? Green. Green, that's right. So we're going to have blue on the leaves and blue on the stems, which will, might look a little strange, but that's part of the process. So we come over here using, say, our one-inch brush into the 
cup of blue paint. Imagination, please. Paint the blue all over. Let it air dry or blow dry. And you actually will see the paint dry. It's wet. And I did forget a very important step. So, for those watching at home and abroad and here, applying the blue paint. Before it dries, an interesting thing is I've written the articles. <laughs> and I paint sometimes. And I painted these. Not having the expert here that does it every day makes a big difference. So we've taken our either $200, $300 Badger brush or our $30 craft brush. And as that's still wet, we're either going to stipple to get a desired effect or we're going to do a matting. Do you have to? Yes, you do or your effect is going to look brush stroked, circles, streaks, etc. So the fine brush, the badger, is literally badger hairs or a brush like this, very soft. And again, they have them in craft stores in places for like $30. Actually, Lowe's and other places do sell them. So we've come in and it's a few strokes across here and the idea is to achieve no brush strokes almost literally impossible but as you practice and get better it's a very light touch keeping your brush perpendicular to the surface here 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 okay and then we've achieved and we less is better and it doesn't hurt about having brush some brush streaks you don't have to worry about because those will fade away but fewer brush strokes you don't bear down because that takes the paint off another trick too is when I say less is better because as you have done this and do this it's starting to dry and as you do additional it starts taking the paint off so a few practice times and you see What's wonderful about this process with the water-based Rochers or Fuse Master paints, and the key to the Stanley K way, if you would, that he's developed over the years, is using water-based paints, Rochers and Fuse Master type paints, with no gums, oils, no, if you would, 900-year-old art. It's been improved and upgraded and modified such that we were able to achieve the same results as 1,000-year-old art, 900-year-old art, utilizing water versus gums, oils, Arabic oils, and Arabic gums and things. So again, sorry about that. For those at home, they're going, nope, he's not doing it right. You're right. So, da 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 We have blue paint. Done. Look at that. It's nicely drying. And we would have done that with the black as well. So going back to the black, we would have had black. Done that, and then dry. So I apologize for this very important step that was left out. I'm glad I caught it because you guys would have thought I was really bonkers. Okay, so we have blue paint. We're going to be taking the blue paint off using, say, an oil brush. This A stiff brush is what you want. We actually will take a brush and cut it such that it will leave a point or rounded in different shapes and forms. But we come in here and we're taking blue off. Everywhere we want blue off. And you'll be able to see through that because it it's, doesn't cover it like a latex or oil-based paint. It, with the light box, you see those black lines underneath. So we're taking the paints off. And normally you're a little more careful than this. And you can come in here with sticks. And what's nice too, because you're heavy black lines, you're able to, 
it's more much easier than the initial some of the initial steps because where the black is that's already fired in so you don't have to take every inch of detail it's much easier to start scraping the paints off so the goal is blue well we're leaving the blue on we want blue as a sky if you didn't want blue as a sky we'd be taking the paints off the sky area or the background area so we want a blue sky we want blue leaves blue stem so everywhere there's we're take we want to take the blue off the yellow rose so in this case we're taking paints off the rose not the sky not the leaves so everywhere there's a rose petal we're taking the paints off okay so yes sir yeah, two questions uh, if you're concerned about the brush strokes couldn't you just take like a, a bottle and, and just miss some water on it so it flattens everything out and smooths it before no. you air dry it it's, it's kind of interesting you talk about that because sometimes we will blow on the piece of glass to help speed it up and just the little spittle from your mouth will actually become a point and that little speck of saliva or water it'll actually spread and actually do weird stuff for the paint so then you're redoing it but that's a good question one, 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 yes the, uh, you're using a blow dryer air, uh, hair dryer like everybody has but um, if you've got a heat gun just common most garages. Well, yeah. Could you use that? You could. Substantially hotter. I'm not sure the effects on the paint because I know some of them are 700 and some are 1500, and we are firing the paints at 1250. So for the person who doesn't have the super duper kiln, could they in fact set the paint with one of those? No, no, because. What happens at the higher temperatures, your glass is actually becoming soft. And the metal oxide actually kind of melts into the glass. So the glass has to get hot in order to accept the paints. And it has to get 1,250 degrees hot. And it has to be done within a, a time ramp. Just like if you would fusing, when you're fusing pieces of glass, we're, instead of fusing two pieces of glass, we're fusing, and I don't want to use fusing, but the, the metal oxide paints are getting fused to the glass and such, if, if you could follow that concept. But you could experiment and try. Be interesting. Let me know how that goes. Okay, so we have blue. So we have taken this out, and we've... Uh, uh, fired it and we come up with something like that bluish okay Bob did this not the professionals <laughs> so we have some blue now I'm going to tell you on this particular piece the key is there's no blue on the petals that's the main idea behind this piece okay this would get a C minus in art class maybe <laughs> okay but what I would do with this piece now is I would redo my blue it's already fired but you can do multiple firings if you want a darker blue or um, not as translucent then you come back in and if you want it to look prettier we come back with the blue and we do blue again and go through that whole process again. Yes, sir. Bob, we're imagining paint, but what is the consistency of your paint mixture? Is it real thin or is it real gooey? That's another good question. Um, it actually gets down to personal preferences, but we, the thinner, we use thin. And you actually would want to test out, um, say, on a piece of glass and, and try the different brushes. And it's not going to hurt anything to, you know, play around and redo because as you come in and mask here if you got too many brush strokes or it doesn't look too good take your paint just 
and or just a little bit of water and and redo that come back in do it again um, so the little bit thicker means you wouldn't have to give say two coats okay the th if you get too thick it it's um, if if you really get thick you won't be able to see your pattern initially under the under the glass one thing um, and you don't get the a flow so it it does get down to personal preference so it can be a, a really thin it can be a heavy it could be a medium you just kind of have to try that and what's nice about the metal oxide paints and water versus gums or arabics you're you're able to uh, add a few drops of water or add a little bit more paint stir and mix we actually have jars of paint sitting for years where we just add a little water come back and mix it back up you can't do that with the gums oil arabic type process so, um, again we're calling this the stanley k way others use it too um, so in this case i would actually come back in with my blue paint add some more blue paint which will help make all these different ugly lines go away and the lightness and it would become a darker a darker blue and then we go through the same process take all the blue off the rose off the rose same process fire it for a second time and then we're going to get a, a much lovelier piece okay that lovelier piece is in your imagination right now okay so the next step and final step is we're going to take our yellow paints and that's over here mixing yellow all over yellow 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 and we come in with our brush badger brush or light brush okay so now this whole piece is yellow don't touch it or you're redoing it meaning redoing it just add another drip of water come back in come back in here yeah. one of the things about the brush you sometimes it's good to have two of these style brushes versus one because you want to make sure it's dry before you go between colors by the process if you're painting lots of different pieces of glass it's good to have multiple uh, uh, blending brushes you know, badger brush or crap brush um, and then another thing we do is we hit tables to get uh, the different color paints out too um, that's something you learn in the DVDs that we offer or in the articles um, so okay so this is all yellow so we come back in with our oil type brushes and we start taking off everything except the petals so then we are taking off, well, other than the petals and the leaves. Thank you. Yeah. And the stem. Correct. Thank you. I'm glad there's somebody in the class that knows exactly what to do. Uh, <laughs> that's a plus. So uh, we, um, we're going to take the yellow off the sky, right, because we want to leave the blue. So we've taken yellow off the sky. We're leaving yellow on the leaves, stem, and petals. So we're coming in here. We could come in with a stick. And we're just cleaning off the yellow, off different places that we don't want it. Okay. So our now we're ready to take this piece into the kiln. hour later goes by voila magic green has appeared green has appeared yellow is there and we have a painted piece okay so that's the real simple version of painting using metal oxide paints the imagination and everything is much appreciated. There are articles, as I mentioned, in Stained Glass News on the process. 
Thank goodness you have glass crafters here to use as a resource. Um, but what we what we also have available is two DVDs. One DVD is beginner painting, two hour process. They um, retail forty nine ninety five. Um, it's two hours on everything, that, all the details that Stanley Klopfenstein has uh, uh, developed over the years to get you through the A to Z of painting, beginner painting on stained glass. All the brushes, the paints, the lining, shading, stick lighting, matting, stippling, um, the coloring, and the complete process. Okay. Then we also have painting faces on stained glass, another two-hour masterpiece by Kaufenstein, same thing, $49.95 available from glass crafters. Okay, now, for those of you that are looking to get into painting, that's very good. That's fantastic. For those of you that just want to continue in another process, the emblems themselves, of which we have about 25 plus different emblems. Religious, various emblems available from glass crafters as a distributor of the emblems, or medallions as some people call them. These are 8 inch emblems, hand painted, kiln fired processes, just like you see here. You, were you able to get all of these? I, just, or I can fire in on them. I would like to do that. Are you always painting on the back side of the glass? Is it just from both ways? Unless you're doing lettering, then you have to do it backwards. There's a difference. Okay. Yes. Um, but normally we show the ideal is painted face, painted face towards you. That you want the most prominence from, but it's either way. Okay. So, <clears throat> I have about 25 different emblems, religious. I'm wearing an emblem, hand painted, kiln fired emblem. Looks like a t shirt. It is a t shirt. <laughs> you too can own your own t shirt. You can do your own, make your own line of t shirts. Um, so, the uh, various types, some churches, small doors, these range typically from retail from like about $60 to $85 for a hand painted kiln fired 8 inch circle which you get a stand with. These pieces then can either be a standalone, you could put a piece of zinc around that, hang it and you've got a completed piece versus a stand. But then you can take those pieces and embellish them. Okay. So you can make large pieces out of these parts. And then we even have See, yep. Real quick. Yep. And you could put, for instance, I don't know if you can catch that on the bottom. You can see how you we've got transoms, additional pieces down here on the bottom. How those might be applied. Okay. And then we even got a line of glass surfers. Joggers, golfers, and others. Okay, so you've done the basic painting, emblems, embellished, and then the ultimate, if you would, would be where you've learned to paint a face. It's a sepia process using two types of paints. It's the exact same process we went through here, except it's a portrait. And anybody know who that is? No. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Jimi Hendrix. In the day. In the day. Um, we do offer painting classes, but we could maybe look at setting up something here in Sarasota for one day. Uh, two day class um, that we offer, so that would be through uh, your contact at Glass Crafters. Um, we have, in addition, just to give you an idea, simple things and ideas for you to use as a uh, customer or client, you can actually take these emblems and it's kind of infinite because this is a hand-painted emblem and a lot of churches don't have a lot of money. Some churches have a lot of money, but you can actually take one of these 8-inch emblems and develop a whole process where you can help the church raise money, like our Savior. We, working with glass crafters, we can come up with ideas to help you develop ways to reach your client base such that you too can offer hand-painted, kiln-fired emblems, medallions, the, with the churches such that you can sell a $10,000 window, a $5,000 window to your church in your local market or area. So we have some other things that friends of glass crafters or friends of stained glass ideas. So let us help you help your client and make everyone happy and everyone a winner. Now, do we have any questions? If you don't have a kiln, um, does glass crafters fire for you? Just a question. We haven't. Certainly could. I mean, I've got a kiln. Saying, I mean, is that a service that you could do? Be happy to. Because I mean, you mentioned that he doesn't have a kiln. I'm thinking about trying to try it without. Just a we do build kilns that are available. Um, we are in discussions with glass crafters. We have built probably close to a hundred kilns. Over the years, we have a small, medium, we have a double wide, and we have a big production kiln. Stanley invented his own kiln over 30 years ago, specifically for glass painters. So that's how we get five, six, seven firings a day versus traditional bricks and other kilns. So that would be something to address with glass crafters. Stained glass ideas is the production side of Ploffenstein stained glass located in Cocoa Beach. So, Stanley is a modern day Leonardo da Vinci. He doesn't want to do hundreds. He likes to do onesie twosies as a modern inventor. He's actually built and designed stained glass guitars that play and sound sweet. Jimmy Buffett owns the Parrot Head stained glass guitar at Travels Margaritaville. So, I own the Celtic electric stained glass guitar. We've done dragons. We've done butterflies. We've done anything you can imagine. And for $25,000, you too could own a Klopfenstein stained glass hand-built, one-of-a-kind guitar. Yes. And be looking for YouTube scenarios on the guitars. Because he also does wood-based guitars, um, same type thing. At 52 years old, he learned to play guitar because he wanted to build a stained glass guitar. And somebody says, oh, it would never play or it would never work. And so that motivated him to become proficient. And one of the first things he did, he thought he would... Um, Learned to play the guitar so he could learn all the parts and pieces, and then he built them. And after a few trial and errors, he perfected it, and he's still building guitars. One of the last ones he just finished is the stained glass angel guitar. Again, all our stained glass guitars light up, and they all play and sound sweet. So do the wood guitars. And if you go to Margaritaville, last time we checked, it was in South Carolina, or you could go to Stained Glass Ideas, on Facebook, facebook.com, stained glass ideas, and see guitars.
So that would maybe be an ultimate project That's of a client of glass crafters. <laughs> That's a big project. <laughs> That's a big one. There, that's the ultimate. One of my future uh, commissions is a Elvis stained glass guitar that we're looking to do a limited edition for Graceland. That's cool. But um, please contact uh, Glass Crafters if you want a guitar because we can work something there too. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Um, I certainly have enjoyed this and. Uh, um, Please send us some feedback to Glass Crafters. Let them know you like, didn't like, are totally confused. Um, understand. <laughs> no. Please ask them to have us back. We'll show you maybe get Stanley over here and have him do painting faces on stained glass or something like that. That would be a, a real treat and joy. And uh, maybe I could drag him over, which I did for Hurricane Matthew. Because um, <laughs> we had to get out of Cocoa Beach. So, uh, Thank you again. Appreciate it.